So, um, yeah, week nine documents. The trench poets are basically writing down what they're seeing and they are experiencing World War I firsthand. Um, it's absolutely awful. And it's unlike any war that anyone has ever seen before in the history of humanity. Uh, Younger, the second document talks about why that is um, a little, in a little bit more detail. Uh, did any, I mean, I'll just throw this out here. And if, um, if I get, if I get crickets, then I'll just kind of ruminate um, <laughs> on this. But did anyone pick up any particular, like, any, any lines that resonated with you personally in this poem or any kinds of emotions that you got from this po from these poems? There's two of them. Did anything stick out to you as being especially like graphic or powerful in any way? Which poem? The, um the first one or the one about the the white man's burden oh no i'm uh, particularly the trench poems trench poets in the on page 897 that's where we're at this week white man's burden um that that is another poem that i'd like you to sort of <laughs> well was that last wait was that last week already it was last yeah. week. Wow. Yeah, that's that's also like um, that's also discussed in the paper assignment for this week. So we, we can talk about that as well. Um. The thing that I um, got from this poem was how he described the soldiers, how they were bent double like old beggars under sacks, like knock kneed, coughing like hags and stuff. And then how they were, um, they lost their boots, but they limped on bloodshed. And then they all went blame, lame and blind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, it's pretty gruesome. Yeah, there's there's things like that. That, that, part, that part particularly describes, um, especially the blindness, uh, the, the, the gases, like the biological warfare or chemical, chemical warfare, I should say that was used in World War One, because for the first time chemical warfare is introduced where the, the sides would lob gases like chlorine gas or mustard gas at each other and it would blind, it would attack the optic, attack the optic nerves first. And so s soldiers caught up in those gas attacks uh, would go blind because um, your eyes kind of melted, which is really awful. So yeah, like bent double, you know, uh, walking around without any shoes. It, sometimes soldiers would get blasted. Even if you survive the impact of like an artillery shell hitting nearby, um, you could get literally blasted out of your boots because um, the force of impact was so great. Yeah, good, Katie, thank you. I mean, it's it's this kind of stuff that describes World War I and, it, and it's a particularly awful war in its brutality and inhumanity. Um, most of Western warfare prior to this involved hand-to-hand -hand combat, you know, swords and shields and armor and horses and stuff. And then you get the, the advent of gunpowder. It was widespread just a couple hundred years before this. And that, but you're still like within shooting range. Like you still have to shoot at someone you can see. Um, World War One is, really weird and different because for the first time m most of the casualties that are incurred during world war one are from like artillery shells like from mo like batteries placed miles away and you just hear the whistle of a shell coming at you and that's the last thing you hear it's like you, like you don't even see the person who's trying to kill you um so it's a uniquely terrible form of warfare in its impersonality in the level of its barbarity uh you know you, you mentioned the blindness and the, the cripple the lame you know there's just millions of soldiers that come out the other end of this that are scarred for life they're either blind or deafened or missing limbs or whatever or to, or psychologically tra traumatized um and so you know like i wanted to sort of 
assign this just to give a really good visceral sense of this war. And we don't need to linger on this <laughs> point for too long because it's really depressing. But the, the paper asks you to, you know, think about how civilized was the West during this period. And you could answer that in a couple different ways. Like you could look at the progress of technology as a good thing, you know, or you could look at how the, how Western countries are able to dominate the rest of the world as, as a, as a symbol of civilization, you know, or you could look to these documents like this, the trench poem, two trench poems. And you could say like, you know, how far have we actually come in the sense that we can kill each other so efficiently, uh, we can maim and mangle and scar millions and millions of supposedly civilized, you know, good Christian soldiers uh, fighting one another. Like, that's terrifying. That's, hor that's horrible. So, so this is ammunition, pun intended. Um, for you to use in that essay um, in whatever way you see fit. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and then, well, and then it's kind of weird because like Rupert Brooke, um, I mean, the, fir the first poem kind of also portrays the, uh, the patriotism, I guess, that people are feeling and the, the eagerness Rupert Brooke, you know, is kind of excited for the war in 1914. Um, and this is how a lot of people welcome World War I. That's how they respond to it. It's like, yeah, we're going to win. Our side is awesome. We're going to win. This, 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 this whole thing's going to be over by Christmas. And then it drags on for four years and millions of casualties and horrific things. And so that, that optimism, remember we talked about, you know, earlier in the week, that optimism of modern science and modern progress and all this stuff, that optimism is very quickly dampened by the realities of the war. So, yeah, I think that's good. Okay, so, and then uh, Junger, Storm of Steel. Um, a lot of Germans especially write really cool reflections of World War One after it's over. Or we see a lot of, we see a lot of um, works written uh, pertaining to German soldiers. German, Germany played probably the biggest role in World War One. They end up more or less losing, um, but they suffered more casualties than anybody. They, they fought harder and longer than anyone else. Um, and it was kind of this national effort. It eventually sets them up for World War II. But so Younger is one of these guys who kind of reflects on the nature of warfare. Um, and it, it describes the, the British bombardment and, and having kind of a psychological effect. Did, did anyone want to talk about the kind of the psychology of World War I here? And this document, it kind of talks about the, the mental state of the soldiers. Um, did anyone pick up on this? Weren't they really excited to go to war before they did? But then whatever they did, it was just really bad. Yeah. Yeah, and that's universal. Like, that's every country that goes to war. Their soldiers are like, yes, let's do this. And then they get there and they experience the horrors. And it's mostly like young, it's like young men in their late teens, early 20s. Makes up the bulk of this fighting force at the beginning of the war. And so they're, they're kind of naive. They are fresh out of school a lot of times. They have all these romantic ideas about what war is going to be like. And then they get there and they see that it's horrifying. Um, but yeah, there's a, so yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about particularly the artillery attacks. So the, you know, cannons on the other side that you, you can't even see because they're miles away from you. Launching shells to blow you up. Um, and, you know, uh, it makes it hard to actually do anything. Cause like, if you rush forward, 
you're just going to get bombarded by artillery. Like it's better to stay in your trench and try and stay safe. But if you go into like open field, you're going to get mowed down by artillery or machine guns. You're going to get caught on barbed wire. And so it's World War One's really hard to do anything because of the technology involved. Um, he describes artillery fire of a hitherto unimagined intensity rolled and thundered on our front. Thousands of twitching flashes turned the western horizon to a sea of flowers. All the while the wounded came trailing back with white dejected faces huddled in the, the ditches by the gun and ammunition columns. Um, and so there's this, you know, he, he, he goes on to talk about kind of hundreds of he heavy batteries concentrating and um, just, just the, just the, the constant thunder, like the, the artificial thunder noise of artillery cannons firing day and night. And so like soldiers can't sleep. Um, the, the word, it's like being, if you've ever been to like in a tornado drill, you know, or like a really bad storm and you're kind of hunkered down and you're like, okay, are things getting louder? Uh, is the storm moving away? I can't really tell. Like you're, you're constantly, your nerves are frayed because you're constantly anticipating something bad happening and you don't, and you don't know when it's going to happen or if it's going to happen. So imagine doing that day after day after day after week after week, month after month, year after year. <laughs> and no wonder a lot of these soldiers come out of the war psychologically traumatized, you know, uh, shell shocked was the term. We call it PTSD now. So this is how battle is different in World War I. You know, I, I asked a question about this, like, in all different periods of human history, you could probably see the person who's trying to kill you. And now warfare is so impersonal, it's so advanced that human beings are just constantly being thrown into the meat grinder. Is that progress? Is that civilization? You know, that's, that's up for you guys to decide. Uh, what do you think you, one last thing, and, and then, you know, we can keep this short. Um, what do you think he means by, uh, at the very end of this document, Younger says, chivalry here took a final farewell. What do you think that means? Just that it got more intense and that it wasn't really like a game. I mean, it wasn't just individual people shooting at each other, but it was just a whole mass of shooting. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, um, you know, human conflict as we know it is gone forever. There used to be this, there used to be this code of honor during warfare, you know, like, uh, yeah, you're, you're just individuals kind of shooting at each other. Almost like polite dueling back in the middle ages, there used to be like jousting, you know, it's kind of an honorific, like, um, combat, uh, Casualties used to be really low in warfare because basically you're not out to just butcher the other side. You're out to make them break formation and run away. Or you, or you would take prisoners. You know, if you surrounded the enemy, you could take prisoners, but you wouldn't kill them, right? So, like, there used to be this kind of chivalry, this, this code of honor, you know, that you're not just out to destroy other bodies. You're not out to just destroy other parts of humanity. And now that's what warfare is. It's like, you're just trying to kill as many people as possible. Um, and that's horrifying. That horrifies the people at the time. That horrifies us now. Uh, you know, think of how we can, how we like wage war now. We do it with drones, you know, hellfire missiles loaded onto unmanned drones. So like it's some guy in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, blowing up a terrorist camp or what we hopefully think is a terrorist camp in Afghanistan, thousands of miles away. There's no chivalry in that, right? There's no honor in that. There's no, there's no personal component to this warfare. Uh, it's just, it's been taken over by technology. So, so, so essentially what I'm trying to get at here is, you know, in relation to the paper, especially, um, 
that's due by the end of today, you know, you can talk about civilization as, you know, like obviously it's progressing in the West and it's, it's uh, thing, you know, we're, we're capable of doing bigger things than ever before. Or you could look at, at the dark side of this and be like, well, uh, we're butchering each other by the millions in these wars in a really impersonal way and it's psychologically traumatizing and it ruins whole nations. Is that progress? Yeah. You know. So how you want to look at that is up to you. There's really there's not a right or wrong answer. I just want to see you use these documents like uh, like White Man's Burden or the Trench Poets or you know like the things we've been talking about to answer those questions. Are there any questions before we go? We'll keep this short and sweet. Okay. Thank you, Katie, for bailing me out today. <laughs> I appreciate your participation. All right. Well, if you have any questions about anything, guys, just let me know and, uh, and have a good one. Thumbs up. <laughs>